All right, well, thanks, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. I am painfully aware that I'm the only thing that stands between you and the networking reception, so I will try and keep these comments brief. Uh, but I did think it, it's, it's worthwhile reflecting on what we've accomplished over the last year, uh, because it's been a very productive year, frankly, for the organization. Uh, but before we get into the details of what we've accomplished over the last year, uh, next slide, um, I thought it was worthwhile just reflecting on the fact that 2014 is actually a pretty significant year for the organization. So if you haven't reflected on it, it's you know the 35th anniversary of ACT, it's the 25th anniversary of IAC, which means that we've been collaborating between government and industry for over a quarter century. Um, so that's a pretty significant milestone for the organization. Um, there are relatively few other organizations that have achieved that level of longevity and track record of collaboration in this space. Uh, and so to mark that, that, we are actually organizing an anniversary event um, for September 17th. It'll be in the evening. Uh, there will certainly be more details that come about that event and what it consists of and so forth, but I wanted to make sure you're all aware of that. Um, we have Sarah DiCarlo and, and at the moment Dave Wintergren and some other folks working on that event, so I'm sure it'll be a great way of marking that milestone, um, but uh, it's certainly a, a significant achievement for the organization. Uh, next slide. So it, most of you will recall that this program year started off a little unusually in the sense that this was the first year that we were trying to implement an act I act strategic plan. Uh, and for those of you who recall, that strategic plan really tried to focus the efforts across all of our activity areas around four major priority areas. Um, so the first being planning, management, and delivery of IT services and solutions. The second being secure sharing and safeguarding of information. The third being innovation and digital government, and fourth and finally evolving the workforce. Uh, and the intent there was to provide those four priority areas to focus all of our activities, whether it's in the SIGs and working groups, whether it's in our professional development programs, our conferences and events, our Institute for Innovation, and really drive all of those activities um, to some level of outcome or uh, accomplishment throughout the course of the year, and really leverage all of those activities collectively to better uh, enable some of those significant outcomes. Um, so this is a chance to you know, reflect back and see were we successful in driving to some of those outcomes and realizing some of the promise of, of what the strategic plan hoped to accomplish. So next slide. Um, I think what you'll see is that we've actually been quite successful. Um, it's still, I think, a work in progress in terms of how we actually govern uh, all of the activities through our priority area leads that we established this year. Uh, but when you look back at all of the things we accomplished, and this is certainly by no means a comprehensive list, um, we've done some pretty significant things that are directly relevant to problems facing government and to questions that, frankly, government has asked of ACT IAC. Um, and probably where we've made the most progress and impact is in the planning and planning management and delivery priority area. So when you look back on what we did this year, we released a, a well-received product from the Institute for Innovation that was actually requested of us from the federal CIO and CTO. Um, so that was something that they actually approached ACT IAC with as a project for us to undertake and a question uh, for us to answer for them, which is how does the government transform the way it thinks about building and buying solutions? Um, so it really predated some of the more recent focus since the fall on this whole notion of IT programs and project delivery within the federal government. And it really got out in front of some of those issues around how do we reuse solutions and capabilities more effectively? How do we approach buying and building solutions from a more collaborative and agile approach? How do we share solutions across government? Uh, and we had a chance to deliver that to the federal CIO and his staff earlier this year, and, and it's safe to say it was well received and was the foundation for some continued dialogue with the administration around this issue of you know, generically smarter IT and how does the government be smarter about the way in which we think about delivering IT in support of government's mission. Um, that also led to some additional dialogue which resulted in the 7S for Success framework, uh, which I think most of you probably heard about, um, and it was featured in actual congressional testimony that Dan Chenick delivered um, not too long ago. Um, so another high visibility uh, product for the organization, one that answered some specific questions that the administration was asking of us, and uh, a product that got very uh, wide exposure in a, a well-publicized forum um, as you know, the organization was recognized for some of the thought leadership that it delivered on some important issues facing government. Um, we've also had, you know, since then, some continued engagement on this issue of 
you know, how do we as government deliver, um, you know, IT more effectively, this whole priority area around smarter IT that's now part of the administration's management agenda, um, and we've had additional dialogue around the procurement-related aspects of that. Um, so you heard earlier about some of the ongoing dialogue around Mythbusters and government industry engagement and so forth. Um, we've also been engaged in the dialogue that the Office of Federal Procurement Policy recently uh, initiated around some of the questions about how do we make it easier for industry to work with government and so forth. Uh, so we remain an active participant with the administration and all parts of OMB, frankly, on some of these questions that are clearly high priorities for the administration and questions that they're turning to act IAC to help answer. Uh, and, you know, certainly you've seen further evidence of that in some of the recent events that we've held, whether it's Acquisition Excellence, the Small Business Conference, Excellence.gov, and we've had a lot of great participation from senior government officials in all of those events um, that have really helped illustrate how relevant and meaningful and impactful those events are in terms of helping the government think through questions and problems that, that they're facing and that they're frankly struggling with. Uh, and last but not least, and, and you heard about this earlier, we're putting on another shared services forum later this year, building on a very successful shared services forum last year. Um, so that continues to be an area of focus as well for uh, not just ACT IAC, but clearly the administration. Um, so I think a, a huge amount of relevant work that we're doing in that area and our engagement at senior levels in the administration continues around some of those, those very relevant and important issues. Uh, and the second priority is secure sharing and safeguarding. Um, I think most of you are aware that we've had a pretty close relationship with Shamandra Paul and the program manager for information sharing environment uh, and have been very involved in some of the acquisition related aspects of um, delivering on the national strategy for information sharing and safeguarding around standards based acquisition and, and other efforts there. Um, so again, that's a case where senior government leaders have turned to ACT IAC as a valuable forum to address questions of how a, a significant national strategy is implemented in practice in a way that is understandable and executable both for government and for industry. And that's a unique perspective that we bring to some of those questions because there are a few other organizations that can provide that integrated perspective from both a government and an industry side. Uh, third, innovation in digital government. We had a, a tremendous event that Sarah and the team organized around igniting innovation to celebrate some of the innovation that's going on in government, which I think we all recognize is too often unrecognized in terms of, you know, showcasing some of the, the true innovation that's happening in the government. Um, and on top of that, we've uh, rolled out this year the Smart Lean Government uh, concept, which I think has also gotten a lot of interest and attraction from the standpoint that it addresses some of the questions that government has asked around, you know, how do we deliver better services to our constituents, whether it's citizens or businesses or others, um, in a way that is, uh, you know, less uh, centered on agencies and more focused on the services that are being delivered. So, you know, can we focus more on life events or other triggering events um, in which individuals or businesses or, you know, someone needs to interact with the federal government and how do we make that interaction as seamless and as easy as possible. So Smart Lean Government tries to answer a lot of those questions and I think provides a great framework for moving forward in answering some of those questions. Uh, and then we've also done some great work around APIs and adoption of APIs across federal agencies and also in the area of mobility and you heard about the, the mobile app fair that's coming up as well. So I think a lot of tangible evidence of, of impacts and outcomes that we've delivered in that area. And last but not least, in evolving the workforce, I mean, obviously you're familiar with the, the ongoing professional development programs that we've always delivered and that have always been tremendously well received. We have agreed this year to create a fourth professional development program, so on top of associates and voyagers and partners, adding a more senior program we're calling Champions to focus on more senior government officials who are really at the executive level and who are looking for uh, some unique professional development opportunities that aren't delivered through traditional executive development type programs. So one's probably focused more on program delivery, um, stakeholder management, some of the other skills that really aren't always addressed in more traditional executive development programs. Um, we talked earlier about the fact that the Academy has really been revitalized under Jimbo Prey's leadership, uh, and we're really looking at that as you know, a much more integral part of a more holistic professional development portfolio uh, that we provide. Uh, and then last but not least, I think many of you are aware 
remember that our immediate past president, Darren Ash, serves as one of the chairs of the Workforce Committee on the CIO Council. So we're looking to remain engaged in some of the efforts around uh, that particular uh, committee and some of the efforts that they're uh, putting in place uh, around workforce-related issues for the federal IT workforce. So a huge number of accomplishments. Clearly, this is not exhaustive, but we did think it was worthwhile highlighting some of the work that's, that's occurred in the last year. Uh, and we are also looking at the end of this program year to publish essentially a year in review. Because I think you know, many of us get focused in particular areas, whether it's a SIG or a professional development program, and we tend to lose sight of all the great stuff that's happening throughout the rest of the organization. And this will be a chance for us to look back and you know, reflect on all the impacts that we've had as an organization. And I think when you compile it all in a form like that, um, it's really impressive the work that, frankly, all of you have done, because it, it all gets done by the volunteers in this organization, uh, and also, frankly, by the staff of act -IAC as well. So um, I know the staff are here, so um, please acknowledge their efforts as well. So again, I think you know, for a first year of operating under a strategic plan, a lot of great work. Uh, certainly, I'm looking forward in the next year to continue to work with Dan um, to further uh, realize the potential of the strategic plan as an organizing framework for all of the great work that we do. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk about also is, you know, just this, this notion of unity of purpose within the organization. So, you know, clearly the, the priority areas and the priority area leads were an attempt to provide that unity of purpose across all of the activities in the organization. Uh, but that theme has really extended into other areas as well. Uh, so, you know, when we look at the executive committees, both ACT and IAC, um, we've really tried to bring the executive committees more closely in alignment this year as well. And that uh, goes uh, from the standpoint of beginning and ending the program years with joint offsites with the executive committees to really get us all on the same page in terms of where we're heading in the upcoming program year and reflecting on lessons learned from the prior program year and really setting a shared agenda for things that we want to accomplish in the coming program year. Uh, and then checking in with each other on a regular basis through joint executive committee meetings. Um, because I think really what we've learned is that we're most effective when we bring together the government and industry aspects of act IAC um, to provide that joint, that joint vision, that joint leadership, um, and that truly collaborative approach to moving the organization forward. Uh, and that extends to our Executive Advisory Council as well. So we bring that organization together about you know, roughly on a quarterly basis, um, and that, that is a shared environment as well. It's government and industry, um, because I think we can have a most productive dialogue and a most relevant dialogue when we have both sides of the relationship in the room at the same time, because we can better learn from each other and we can better build on each other's experiences to really move things forward more effectively when we have that, that joint dialogue. Um, so we're looking to continue to do that in the coming year. Um, I think Sherry mentioned this in terms of really institutionalizing joint government and industry leadership at all levels within the organization. And we're really trying to make that a reality going forward as well. Next slide. So just to provide a brief preview of the next program year, and again, certainly I'm looking forward to working with Dan to make some of this a reality, or hopefully all of this a reality. Um, for those of you who were at MOC, I think we had a, a great uh, change of pace in that event in the sense of really rethinking the, the way that event was laid out to make it a much more interactive and collaborative and outcome-focused event. Um, so the six tracks that were organized in MOC are really intended to carry forward throughout the program year. And the intent is to deliver on some of the promise that was uh, framed at MOC throughout the course of the program year. And I know we'll be working with some of the organizers of MOC to, to make sure that that momentum that was generated at MOC carries forward throughout the year um, and certainly comes to fruition at ELC, for example, uh, where we're similarly looking to reshape, rethink, reimagine that event to make it more interactive, more involving um, for the participants and focusing on two major tracks at the or at the event, uh, one in shared solutions and the other in citizen services. Um, so look for more details shortly on what ELC will look like, but that promises to be a great and exciting event uh, coming up in the fall. Uh, we talked, or I talked a little bit about the priority areas. I think one of the things we're going to focus on in the coming year is how do we strengthen the use of the priority areas to make sure that we really are delivering the most value that we can to the government around some of these questions that, that government is clearly facing um, and that they're turning 
to us to answer. Um, so I think we can we can strengthen the way the priority areas function and how we lead the priority areas um, without making it too bureaucratic, but really making sure that we're delivering on everything that we're we're hoping to accomplish in the year. Uh, and certainly a, a direct relationship there is with the, the shared interest groups and their activities and making sure that we're connecting uh, you know, what we're trying to accomplish with the priority areas with all of the great work that's happening within the SIGs and making sure, frankly, that we're getting the SIGs and their efforts the visibility throughout the organization that they deserve. Um, so we'll be working uh, to uh, bring those sets of activities in, in closer alignment. Uh, and then we've also identified that one of the cross-agency priority priorities that the administration has identified is one where we think we can contribute a lot, and that's in customer service. Uh, so we had a chance to talk to some of the leaders of that priority for the, the administration, and it's clear they're working through some of their thoughts around what that priority means and how they're going to tackle it. And I think we have tremendous opportunity to contribute valuable perspectives there, certainly from the standpoint of you know industry and how industry thinks about customer service and how those lessons may or may not translate into the federal space, but really helping the federal government think through you know, what does it mean to deliver better customer service as a federal government and what does that look like when it's accomplished well. Um, so we're certainly looking on focusing in that area in the, the coming program year because I think we've, we've already demonstrated some value to the administration in that area and we can continue to contribute a lot to that, that question. Uh, I think you know, certainly this issue of improving communications and outcomes in acquisition uh, clearly remains a vital interest on both sides of the government and industry relationship. Um, you heard about the Mythbusters uh, forum coming up. There's ongoing questions that we have with OMB, with OFPP, with others around how do we how do we bridge what is still a gap. So despite all of the efforts on the last couple of years to do myth busting and some other things, I think MOC made it painfully clear there are still gaps there in terms of perceptions and reality and, and how we actually uh, can make acquisition a more effective tool to move government forward. Uh, and we obviously have some unique perspectives, again, to offer in that area to break down some of those barriers, to dispel some of those myths, to really help government and industry work together more effectively. Uh, what uh, One of the other outcomes of MOC, for those of you who were uh, there, there was a fellows forum at the end of MOC, uh, and the fellows uh, really latched on to that specific issue as one they want to help tackle as well in the coming program year of, you know, how do we improve government and industry engagement throughout the acquisition life cycle? So clearly a lot of work we can do there. Uh, you know, one, one, I would say, area of, you know, potential concern for the organization is government participation. Um, and I say that because when you look at some of the leaders in government who have left in the last year or so, and I'm thinking of, you know, Dave Wintergren and Roger Baker and Dave McClure and some of the other folks that have been very strong advocates for ACT IAC, who understand the value of the organization, who you know know to come to us when they have a question that they need answered or a problem that they need solved. Um, you know, we're losing a little bit of that visibility in government, frankly. So a lot of that senior level sponsorship and visibility um, is is moving on, uh, and we need to find a way to rebuild some of that that set of trust and relationships and familiarity with the organization, uh, not just at the senior levels, but at all levels of government. And that's certainly going to be a conscious effort over the next year is to try and rebuild some of that, that community that understands and values ACT IAC from a government perspective. Uh, and then last but not least, you know, the, the broader question of just positioning the organization for long-term success. Uh, so some of that is you know, certainly extending the idea of membership and the notion of who constitutes a, a member of ACT IAC on the government side beyond the traditional IT community. So looking at different constituencies like you know, CFOs and Chicos and chief acquisition officers and program folks and, and you know, digital services folks and folks that we not frankly haven't even existed in some of the history of, of ACT IAC but who are now increasingly a part of the way government delivers services and we need to bring those folks into the fold as well. And on the flip side, on the industry side, there are now industry partners that are non-traditional um, providers to government um, that we also need to think about bringing into the fold for the organization. Um, so I think you know, lots of work we can do there to make sure that we remain a vibrant and successful and relevant organization going forward. So um, with that, that's all of the, the talking points that I had for this afternoon, but I'm happy to entertain any questions if anyone has any for me before I let you free to go to the networking reception. Any questions for me? All right. Well, thanks very much. And again, thank you for all of the...
thank you for all of the interest in the organization that you've shown from a, you know, from a sponsorship and a membership perspective, but more importantly, from a volunteer perspective. Again, none of those accomplishments that I went over would have been possible without all of your participation, your commitment. So thank you very much. Thank you.